All right, we are at the Titsworth grave. Don't laugh now, I know <laughs> what you're thinking. But this guy has a little bit of, and his name is Adri Abraham also. Yep. Right? Mr. Abraham Titsworth. Tell us about Abraham. Abraham Titsworth was a world-renowned tailor downtown here in Chicago. He is responsible for tailoring and making Abraham Lincoln's inauguration um, suit. How about that? Mm -hmm. How would you ever know? I was just, we were walking over here and I'm like, how do you know all this stuff? Holy cow. All right, let's go to the next one. So we're walking along here. Hold on, Britton. Look at that. There's, there's actually the tombstone of Mary Shedden. Sure. And if you guys watch my episode, I'll put the link in. That is the the ghost face. The go yeah, if you look in that granite, you either see her skull or her face. Big yeah. time legend. She was poisoned by her husband, it is said. Yeah. But wh wh where are we going now? We got another story right here, right? This big boulder, I think. Yeah, the big boulder. But just one little clip on Mary Shedden um, that I do have to, I got to. Um, whether or not you'll see a ghost face, that's just, you know, imagination in your heart. You take that on an urban legend. But there is. A legend that is true about that area of the cemetery that involves um, vampires. Yeah, a pal of Dr. Uh, Van Zandt Blaney was named um, Dr. Charles Dyer. Charles Dyer, one of Chicago's awesome pioneers. Dig into Charles Dyer. He's not buried here, but Charles Dyer um, came with a family who one of their female family members, though, the woman died in 1875. One of those headstones over there are not eleg uh, legible because they were from the old city cemetery. I haven't found any grave with the date 1875, but 1875, it for certain happened. Dr. Dyer came out here with a family and they exhumed a woman. They exhumed her body and they cut her lungs out and then took her lung, and then the priest like yeah, the buried vampire the lungs thing. Right. on the spot. Yeah, and they believed that that would, she died from tuberculosis. That's the old, they're spitting or out mm -hmm. of the blood out of the nose, they think they're vampires. And then within a year, family members were having dreams about her. They were, they had Dr. Dyer come out and dig her up and actually commit the, or to do the, the exorcism or whatever you would right. call that. Yeah, wow. Around Mary Shedden's grave. Right, right over there by there. Mary Shedden. Yeah, there was a What's, what was her name? Don't know. Don't know, but it was a, vam a mm -hmm. vampire panic. Mm -hmm. You know, vampire we were in Vermont. We did exactly. that story yeah. of the ransom boy and, how and the know. Corwin. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. awesome, too. That was such a great story. Dyer went on record in a couple of the newspapers, though, and told the story and verified that it was true, that he had actually came out here, but he was sworn to secrecy by the woman's family. Uh, here we go, Ebenezer Peck. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Peck, Peck, incredible. You have his wife next to him. Uh, Ebenezer Peck was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. Um, his story, how this ties into Titsworth, after Lincoln was... After Lincoln was elected, he came into town and he had a big dinner meeting. He had a big party over at Ebenezer Peck's mansion. Who had the party? Abraham, Abraham Lincoln? Lincoln? Yeah. Is this before he was president? Uh, before he was president. And during this party over at Ebenezer Peck's homestead, uh, he was introduced to Hannibal Hamlin from Maine, who became his, uh, who became his running mate. You have at this time in town, Stephen Douglas versus Abraham getting in the back and forth. You have the rich and famous, you know, jumping on board with the winner. Very that cool. That would have been Abraham Lincoln. Uh, at that time, you just had, and then really for a lot of the families in this area, you have a lot of claim the fames to Abraham Lincoln, but you do factually indeed have uh, ties to Abraham Lincoln. Here, Perkins Bass in this real nice elaborate sarcophagus. Uh, we don't even really have to venture over him, but Perkins Bass also present at Ebenezer Peck's home that night. Um, Perkins Bass, a friend of confidant, he at one point during Lincoln's second term became attorney general, but he was enemies with Andrew Johnson after the assassination. That's that sarcophagus? Yeah, Perkins Bass was assassinated though. No one stuck up for him. All his friends he had in Washington become his enemies, and then president-elect Andrew, jo 
after Lincoln was assassinated, I believe Andrew Johnson's over. Andrew Johnson immediately fires Perkins Bass as Attorney General. Interesting. Perkins Bass goes around rallying a cry on let's uh, uh, Andrew Johnson. He was uh, impeached. <laughs> there you he was go. Impeached by the help of this guy and the and the, uh, and the feud between the two of them. Yeah. Okay, gang, we are now at the grave of maybe one of the culprits, maybe one of the villains. Remember the story about the radium girls? Tell us what's going on here, Britton. Uh, Henry Thayer and his partner, they owned, a, uh, they owned an art supply uh, paintbrush manufacturing company. And the calligraphy pens and paintbrushes that were being sent to the, to the, to the, uh, to the gals that were, you know, become poisoned by the radium when they were... They were like designing watches. Right. Uh, this was their the company, Henry Thayer's company. So they were connected to the watches. Yeah. The, the, the little tiny paintbrushes, and the girls would lick them. Yeah. And take that radium and mm -hmm. the real thin and, paintbrushes and uh, turn green. And in particular, uh, calligraphy blue. pens. He went for a patent on a calligraphy pen too, also Thayer. And then I believe partner uh, Thayer Cleaver. Uh, I might be wrong, but I believe Thayer Cleaver, the name of the. Uh, so of the Edward. Colville Cleaver was one of the men, one of the partners. Mm -hmm. And then here Henry is Henry. So this guy was part of it, gang. I, not directly, it's kind of indirectly being a culprit of this, making a ton of money off, off those poor women. Yeah, in this section, a lot of these families uh, outside of their trades and what they were you know, famous for. We've got tailors, art supplies, carpenters. One thing popular about all these families is these are the founders of the Board of Trade. All right, it's mausoleum time. We'll take a break and do a mausoleum. This is the Stromberg Mausoleum. Who are the Strombergs? Alfred Stromberg, a Swedish immigrant. Alfred Stromberg, while he was over in Sweden, I think you can get a good look at it. I don't think this is the family's crest, but there are a bunch of relatives' ashes in there and everything. You get all the Masonic stuff in there. Alfred Stromberg, um, in Sweden, got into contact with Alexander Graham Bell. And oh. between the Americans and the Swedes, they start coming up with different telephone equipment. Uh, that's where he originates, in Sweden, making parts for telephones and whatnot, phonographs. Uh, after he gets here to America, he had something really awesome, really incredible, a patent um, that was bought off of him. And he, he already came over with money, but once he got here and sold off his idea, he became very rich and he was able to just take a step back from all the telephone and all the, uh, you know, the telephone, telephone telephone um, he does take a break for about 10 to 15 years and then he decides to get into this new industry that's coming at the turn of the time the, which is uh, automotive industry. automotive industry yeah, he okay. created a carburetor um, the Stromberg carburetor no way yeah he did it after the telephones Very Alfred, cool. he's right he he's right here his wife is up above him and then I is I got be their daughter up there on the top all right, we are at the George W. Noble Mausoleum, 1886. We were here during a live, and as you look here, you can see that there is a hole, well, where the windows are knocked out, and people have broken in here, and we're gonna tell a little bit of the story, but on my live, and I'll, I'll try to do it here with this camera, I don't have the flashlight, but I'll hold this up. And there you can see. Oh wow! You can see the crypt. His is it, crypt. Is it just him? Let's see. Oh, let's see what we got. So there's the bottom one, and I can zoom in on it. There is enough ambient light here. Hold on. Let me get to the zoom. It's way up here. Yeah, that's him. And. Let's see, I got a little glare going here. Hold on. Let's see what else. It looks like those are blanks. Well, there's only two. So here's the deal. Britain is gonna tell us what's behind the story. Who was this guy? Mr. George Noble. When he first came into town, he uh, riding on the lumber industry. He owned a company um, that um, mm -hmm. 
not quite a tycoon, but almost up there. Um, and not so much like owning a lumber mill, but owning enough trees. And, um, from the lumber, he got into a paper mill. Um, paper, paper mill. Uh, he sold that off, and in the last 30 years of his life or so, he just lived as an eccentric kind of, I won't say bachelor because he is married, uh, no children. So uh, he lived in a hotel yeah, the rest of his life? Yeah, he in a couple hotels all around town. Okay. Uh, he actually passed away at the Sherman Hotel, but when he died, he was worth an estimated $2 million, um, and, only, and, and then after he died, he left behind a will where he gave to certain charities and certain businesses and such. Literally, after he died, on paper, it was only half of what he, uh, half of what he was worth. And you had people over the years coming in, you had urban legends, but there was for sure one time in the 1940s that this was broken into and uh, grave robbers. So, yeah, there was just such lore about him from people that knew him in life that, man, that guy, you know, he's got a fortune in that tomb that he's sitting in there all by himself. And so was, they thought that money, the fortune, was buried in here. Yeah. And they probably would climb up. Yep, over the years. Go he's in there. Yeah, you're not getting in here. Look at that. George Noble, rest in peace, sir. All right, we're walking along here, and I just had to stop and take a look at this fire hydrant. This has to be an original fire hydrant from maybe even the 1800s, early 1900s for sure. Look at that. That is the oldest fire hydrant I have ever seen. And it was right by this, this bench. Who knows who the, <laughs> whose bench that is, right? Yeah, purported to be a work of Leonard Volk. Oh, Leonard Volk, mm -hmm. the sculptor? Yeah, no dates, no names. Yeah. Either. And if it wasn't Volk, then it was the individual who did Volk's monument. Because okay. it's just a lot of similarities with it. Cool. A lot of similarities. That's that exact design. What do we got here? We have here, okay, there are three, I believe three, two brothers. Uh, the fire hat on the top how they started, uh, volunteer firefighters, but these graves are actually of police. Okay. And uh, this gentleman right here, Cyrus Bradley, uh, the first chief of police for the city of Chicago. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Well, I can barely read it, sadly. And along the side are brothers. We have John Hodgson, uh, who died in the line of duty, I believe. Okay. And then, but yeah, volunteer firefighters who most famously become uh, police, police chiefs, police inspectors. Okay. Yeah, one of the Hodgsons died in the line of duty also. Neat huh? sculpture on top there. Yeah. And then you have descendants. You have the wife. Um, uh, they married also. You have, you have Bradley Hodgson's, their descendants married. So looking at here, I see a Cyrus Bradley, Henry Cyrus Bradley, probably the son, uh, more Bradley. Here's oh, Lydia. Oh, oh. It's a, uh, is this a pentagon or an hexagon? What's... Don't see, uh, it looks like 1806 to 1852 maybe. Yeah. 52. Very interesting. Alright, we've got something interesting here that Britain has walked us over to. What do we have here, buddy? Oh, well, just looking at it. Tells you he was a soldier. We have so many Civil War, lots of Civil War famous names, um, places. Uh, here, though, Spanish-American War. Okay. And how I first discovered this grave, uh, probably about oh, probably about two years ago, my mother and I were just going through the cemetery, and it was actually knocked over. It was actually knocked really? over, and, and I could just see like the bullets kind of sticking out of the ground. Okay. Uh, I was heartbroken. You can see that it's kind of been disheveled again. Who is, who is this guy, Robert Lone Nelson? Morris. What did he do? One of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. That is neat. Yeah, Mr. Robert Nelson Monroe. Uh, 
slides around a little bit, but it's never coming off again. The lawnmowers knock it over. He was killed. Um, he was killed in Havana. Okay. In 1890. Yeah. He was killed in Havana, Cuba. Uh, Rough Riders. They were mounted cavalry. Uh, or yeah. Very cool. Uh -huh. Rifleman cavalry. Uh, you have at that point cavalry up until that point are just kind of like swordsmen that charge. These guys had the repeater rifles and they really turned the tide in the war in a few few battles that we were getting our butts kicked. Very cool. It's very true. Some of the bravest men and not very popular you know, throughout American history, the Rough Riders. All right, this is the Eisendrath family plot. And I, as well as anyone else, would never know to come here. Why are we here? Uh, in this particular spot for the Eisendraths, you have a, uh, a mother and daughter who perished in the Iroquois Theater fire. We did that episode yeah. at Calvary at the Mandolin Player. You've got 60 victims of the Iroquois Theater fire here at, at, at Rose Hill. Is there a memorial here for that? No, no, the memorial is over at Montrose. Montrose Cemetery, right. Mm -hmm. So we have Natalie. Well, we have mom. So the mom, Eddie? Mm -hmm. Etty? She was taking her daughter, and it was December 30th, 1903. What was that show called? It was like Bluebeard? Yeah. Bluebeard, right? Uh -huh. And the daughter, Natalie, yeah. who was almost eight years old, seven years old, and they were crushed? Yeah, they were crushed. They were found at the bottom of the, of the pile of bodies at the, at the main entrance. Oh. Which had been Terrible. locked from the outside. The right. people inside were locked in. It was a uh, tragedy, an atrocity. Uh, you are not forgotten, Miss, Mrs. Eisendrath and your daughter here. We, uh, Very sad. We find ourselves in the middle of just so much in this area. And uh, we don't even need to walk anymore. I can just kind of from right, right here point. So imagine Sigmund, the father, the heartbreak. Is this the father, mm -hmm. Britain? Yeah. So he lived until 1928. 25 more years. Yeah, look at that. Almost 25 years. Yeah. Just he probably couldn't take another anniversary. No. And you have his father here, Moses. Oh, uh, yeah. Behind Moses Eisendrath, you have one of the Mandels. The Mandel brothers was a very big, uh, a good uh, a dry goods store here in Chicago turn of the century you will find many Mandels right behind us is another Mandel uh, also Edwin Foreman one of the sons of Gerhardt yeah they're all here yeah we were digging into it and then a Mandel behind him yeah all these mausoleums kind of speak for themselves Not yeah to this is no windows no doors this mausoleum here is really imposing yeah it's hard to describe but it's just a massive block now Edwin was he one of the sons of Yes. Gerhard? Yes, sir, he was. He was the middle son. He was the middle son. Yeah, we touched on Oscar and... Uh, Look at that door. Oscar's descendants, we found the link to, uh, to Crowley. Uh, this, this is... Edwin. This is... This, oh, it's so sad because of vandals. Yeah. There's just nothing to look at here. Mm -hmm. But then, it is just such an imposing structure. And now the people that would come in and break into this would be students of the Edward G. Foreman High School. Foreman High School. Kind of a, uh, you your <laughs> were they actually here, busted? Were they, yeah. Oh, they came out mm -hmm. senior year. Mm -hmm. And they were all busting in here. Yeah, back in the 50s and the 60s. Oh, brother. <laughs> all right, we are at the grave of probably what is one of the only porcelains, Britain? Yeah, only one Images. in my mind. And an interesting name. Only ones in Rose Hill, that would be uh, Henrietta Hertz. And related Hertz, there related, it is. related to John Hertz of the Hertz Rent a Car. Hertz Rent a Car. Uh huh. John Hertz used to be buried here. He was reinterred somewhere on the East Coast, and then a majority of the family went with him. Boy, look at that! You can barely yeah. see her. She looks beautiful. Uh huh. Look at that, guys. It's like 18, all washed away. To 1913, she was only 15. 15 years old? Not yeah, even you're 14. right. 14. Daughter. Look at that, it's too bad. But you can kind of see the likeness. Very interesting. Yep. All right. All right, we're at the William B. White Mausoleum here. So 
Britton, what's the story? You were telling me that there were break-ins and weird stuff going yeah. on. And this one is a uh, this one is a mystery. One of my top five mysteries here at Rose Hill because I can't find out anything about this fellow or who he was. Um, vandalism, vandalism over the years. Um, inside. Okay, you can see right away that someone has broken through. No one has come to repair it. But inside, you will just see very, very beautiful mosaic all over the vaults. And, okay. uh, and you can see that some of the vaults have been broken in and messed up. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I'll have to get my cell phone on this one. I can't really... I was told that there see. were devil worshippers here doing some type of... Oh, no way. Uh-huh. That's too bad. Yeah, I can't really see here. I'll get my cell phone. Oh, wow. So can you see the vaults are broken into? Or what do you see? Well, on the lower right hand, we see William. There is a plate. There's a nameplate on his vault. And all of the rest of the vaults, there is eight total. The other seven ones don't have any names on them. Okay. But one that is two spaces above Williams is, uh, it's like the body fluid's leaking out of there. Really? Yeah, Ugh. so maybe there's something, but just the, uh, just the mosaic, just the tile. I have never, ever seen that on a vault. Do you know anything before. about who this guy was? Nope. And but what you do know is that people... Yeah, people for like some reason in. like coming in here and breaking and in. Messing it up. And the fact that it's one of the, as far as insides of mausoleums go, it's like one of the nicest insides yeah. I've seen with the tile work. Look at that insignia mm -hmm. up there. Isn't that the interesting? The stained glass is broken too. It's, uh, it's got some type of barrier around it, but it looks like it's getting, nah, it's, it's still in good shape. That'll hold up. But yeah, the mysteries of, uh, of William White here. Let's get to the bottom of this game. Very interesting crypt here, Farwell. You say that was a senator? Yeah, our House of Representatives, his dad was a senator. Okay. And then the street's named after them. His dad's here also, and he has a great big huge obelisk, Farwell Sr. Yeah, okay, so. So let's go over to this mausoleum. I remember seeing this mausoleum. Yeah, one of the newest ones here. And state of the art as far as mausoleums go in our day and age that we currently exist in here, gang. Uh, once upon a time, there used to be electric or uh, solar panels. So this was all electrified, huh? Uh-huh. Kind of like the sheets with the mm -hmm. telephone. <laughs> Except the this guy was not afraid of getting buried alive. He was paying homage to his wife, right? He sure was, yes. Dr. Shiragi. And you say he was out here yeah. every day? Uh, well, every weekend, every Sunday afternoon, I would catch him out here uh, when I would come to visit my family. But he was, uh, he was a gentleman, he was a pioneer, he was a scholar, he was a saver. Dr. Shiregi is one of the, uh, when you have Romanian immigrants starting to come over in the uh, post-World War II, especially 1960s, Dr. Shiregi was a, uh, he was one of the main doctor, pediatrician, physicians for the Romanian community here on the north side. And he is now interred here with his wife. He's now interred here with his wife, yes. His wife passed away, I believe, 2010. Dr. Shiragi followed, uh, 2018 he passed, friend Dr. Shiragi. I miss him very much. Rose Melita, we saw as I did one of my live stream walks here at Rose Hill last, oh, a few months ago, but we have a little more information now with, that we're with Britain about her story. She died of natural causes, but it's really a kind of a spooky story. Tell yeah. us what... And just who she's tied in through friendships and through the name. Uh, Rosamalita de Cucuy was friends with a nurse named Teresita Bassa, who was murdered um, in the 1970s. She worked over at Edgewater Hospital. Uh, and there's a ghost story with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, def uh, Google search Teresita Bassa murder case gang and it will tell you of a ghost story a few years after Teresita was murdered one of her friends um, was having dreams uh, and in the dreams they were telling her to that um, her jewelry was in the possession of one of the janitors at the hospital 
Yeah, those are the loose facts Ooh. right there. I can't tell it exactly how it was. Uh, the man ended her. up getting caught, though. The detectives went on the testimony of this Filipino doctor. And it was. Who came and said and that his out. wife is having all these visions. He was the murderer. Yeah, they bring the guy in for questioning. When they bring the guy in for questioning, the janitor, which the way he got over to Teresita's apartment and murder her that night, he was going to fix her TV, supposedly. Oh, but while I wonder if I saw him, that on TV. It's been on Unsolved yeah, Mysteries. Yeah, Unsolved many. Mysteries. But as they were interviewing him, the detectives, his right. girlfriend comes in wondering when she can get him out when she's going home and they notice right. the girlfriend is wearing Teresita Bassa's ring oh boy yep and the rest is history he was found guilty of murder this is young Tyrone oh Tyrone Maylord III what I happened to him do we know I don't know his story but I know his family's out here all the time on his birthday which usually 2011. falls 2011 yeah usually falls a Memorial Day weekend poor um, little guy my youngest daughter is born the 25th of May uh, 2008 so there were a few times during her birthday, well, Memorial Day weekend, we would always come out and uh, pay respects to my family. All right, let's walk to your family, yeah, and we're going to conclude the episode here. we got to stop right here first, though, because you are pointing right at... Hinkley. Sure. Oh, yeah, Hinkley. Is, Hinkley bottle. Hinkley, Hinkley and Schmidt? Yeah, right next to Bottled me. water? Oh, no way. Oh, yeah. Look at this, guys. Hinkley and Schmidt bottled water and yes and the schmitz are being remembered with the wreaths oh that's hilarious yeah. i mean it's not hilarious they're dead but it's just unexpected yeah. and i've walked here and i just never put two and two together yeah. Inkley and schmidt okay this is britain's grandfather john matthew colder Staff Sergeant, U.S. Army, World War II, 22nd Infantry, 4th Division, on D-Day, passed in 1981. Thank you for your service, John. Wow, what a legacy you have, Britton. Thank you. Thank you. His headstone here tells it all. It does. Uh, man, he was man. there on D-Day, huh? Yeah, Omaha Beach, the second, wave of, uh, the second wave of troops coming in. Yeah, he saw a lot of action. He, uh, for three weeks, too, into the invasion of France. I've got good photos. I've got pictures of my grandpa when he's uh, the day before the D-Day invasion, when he's sitting in his bunk. In well, bed. maybe you we can, can include see, sure, you can see his some of these pictures edge. here. Uh huh. Yeah. And we do have another story with John Matthew saving the life of a woman. We're not going to get into the story, but we are going to get into that story. This is your grandmother? Yeah. Yeah, my mom's mom. Uh, Francis. Maline. Mylene. Mylene Colder. Wife of John, beloved mother. Mm -hmm. She passed in 94, mm -hmm. late July. My grandma was a florist by trade. She was a she was a florist and she passed it down to my mom and all her sisters. She had a, she had a flower studio which was called Flowers by Colder in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, my grandma raised my grandmother and my mother raised me. Uh, my parents divorced in the uh, my parents divorced in 1987, and my grandma kind of came on board. Um, as we're discussing my parents, though, as weird as this may seem to everyone, my mother's parents are here, but my father is here. And this is my father's grave now. Uh, once again, another veteran too. My father, a Vietnam veteran. Yeah. Well, somewhat of a Vietnam veteran. My dad was uh, my dad was a submariner. He was a radio on the USS Bonefish. The Bonefish, 582. Uh -huh. And this is your dad. Yep. And there's your logo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason. Sure. 2010, he passed away. Yeah. And so Vietnam, he was uh, he was in the sub. Yeah, Holy radio God. man. Uh, most of his time he spent uh, South China Sea doing patrols. Right. Uh, during his uh, service, he lived in the Philippines. He lived in Japan. My dad was all over the place in the 1970s. I mean, I miss him. Great story, buddy. Well, we're going to wrap it up here, gang. And you see there are some beautiful wreaths there that Britain has brought out for his family. Oh, and I leave. I leave. we will munchies yeah for our friends and he's got apples for the deer who are coming over here so we're gonna go feed the deer and we're gonna do this again catch y'all later and everybody be safe